What's up kings and queens, it's Dan from Daft Previews and today I'm going to take you through a comprehensive preview of all the NBA player picks for the six games on this upcoming slate. I got absolutely murdered on picks from the most recent slate. Stick around for the recap at the end of the video if you want to hear me cry about it. I'm not going to lie to you all, I'm a bit intoxicated at the moment. I've been at a wedding, wedding celebration all day, so I don't have any final bets right now, but the analysis should be just as good and it might be even more entertaining. So I'll be going through all the players who have a good and bad matchup to help you with your selections. I'm switching it up today and I'm looking at how these matchups have been based on the defense over the whole season. As always, I'll be sharing my screen and I'll take you through every single player, all of their form lines. I use props.cash to sort through all of this data and I've got a special discount code for all of my viewers. So you can sign up today using the code DAF25 when you sign up. Let's go. We're cooking it, kicking it off with the Brooklyn Nets versus the LA Clippers. And there's quite a few players that I need to run through on this one. The very first one, we're looking at James Harden from the LA Clippers. And we're looking at his points prop for uh, 16 and a half. The Nets allow the fourth most points to point guards over this season. Now, James Harden, he's covered this line in only two of his last 10 games, averaging 15 points per game. Um, in head-to-head -head matchups, he's covered this in five of his last seven against the Brooklyn Nets. He's only played them once this season, and he only scored 12 points. But at that point in the year, he was still uh, unfit, and he wasn't regular for full NBA competition. But he's in much better form now, um, definitely capable. His recent form says that he can't hit it, but at the same time, this line is a little bit higher purely because the matchup is there. We're sticking with James Harden, though. We're looking at his assist prop, and we're looking at under nine and a half assists. So the Brooklyn Nets allow the seventh fewest assists to point guards. James Harden's been great, covering in six of his last 10, averaging 10.2 assists. He has gone under in three straight games, though. And then looking at head-to-head -head matchups, he's gone under in five of the seven games. So strong lean to the under for James Harden. Could there be a value play? I'm not too sure. As you know, I'm a bit too intoxicated and a great rule for betting is if you're under the influence, do not place any bets. Sticking with the LA Clippers though, looking at Paul George and his points prop. And we're looking at an over here of 24 and a half points. The Brooklyn Nets allow the fourth most points to small forwards this season. He's covered in one of three games against the Brooklyn Nets. Looking at his last 10, he's covered this five out of the 10 games, averaging 27 points per game. His last five games have been great. He's covered in four of his last five, averaging 29 points per game um, in head-to-head -head matchups, one of the three. So uh, his recent form is excellent. The matchup is great. So 24 and a half points. Paul George should be able to get that in his sleep, but it's also dependent on how do the other players go. Um, sticking with them, Clippers, Kawhi Leonard, he's got a difficult matchup in this one. The Nets are the fifth fewest points to power forwards. Now, Kawhi Leonard's got under in both games against the Brooklyn Nets. Over his last 10, he's only covered this four times, averaging 22.8 points per game. Um, he was in hot form not too long ago, but entering the new year, he's really started to slow down. And it's not because he's not playing the minutes. It's in some cases it's because he's not taking the field goal attempts, but his field goal percentage has regressed down to 52%. His three point percentage is still great at 46.8. Um, but look, the matchup is difficult. He's gone under his last two against Brooklyn. I wouldn't be surprised if it went under again. Let's jump into the Brooklyn Nets players. And the first one looking at is Nick Claxton. Um, we're looking at an under of 12 and a half points. And that's because the Clippers allow the third fewest points to centers. Obviously, they've got Sainz and Zubak there in the middle. Uh, Nick Claxton is one of the smaller centers in the league. But looking at his last 10, he's covered this five times, averaging 14 points per game. Two head-to-head -head matchups against Zubak and the Clippers. He scored 13 and 15 points. So he's covered this line both times. So just because the matchup is difficult, he's proven to us that he can do it. Over his last 10, you know, he's shown that he can do it too. So um, I disregard the matchup in this one because Nick Claxton doesn't seem to be faced by that. Spencer Din, we do, we're looking at his rebounds and assists in this game. And we're looking at an under an eight and a half assists and rebounds, and that's because the Clippers allow the second fewest rebounds and the fifth least assist to point guards. He's covered this in only two of his last 10, averaging seven rebounds and assists. But in his last four head-to-head -head matchups, he's done quite well. He's covered in three of his last four, averaging 8.5 rebounds and assists. Um, so quite a tricky one. You can go get great odds if you do take the under though. So given the odds are pretty, pretty uh, good, it might be one to consider. Let's jump into the next game, shall we? 
We're looking at the Miami Heat versus the Orlando Magic. And in this one, we're looking at Paolo Banchero. We're checking out his rebounds because the Heat allow the third least rebounds to power forwards on the season. The problem here is that Banchero has been a rebounding machine up against the Heat. He's covered in four of his last five, averaging 8.8 .8 rebounds. Looking at his last 10 games, though, he's covered this six times, averaging 7.3 rebounds. Could this be one of the scenarios where we say, don't worry about the matchup because my man's going to get these boards anyway? Or is this a play that we just choose not to bet on? I'll leave that up to you. The next one is Jimmy Butler, and we're also looking at under in his rebounds because the Magic allow the second fewest rebounds to small forwards. Over his last 10, Jimmy's hit this seven times, averaging 4.8 rebounds per game. And in his head-to-head -head, head -head matchups against the Magic, he's absolutely killed it. Three of three, averaging six rebounds per game. That's got to be a sign that the matchup don't matter because Jimmy's going to get them anyway, right? But look, only time will tell. We shall see. And the next one we're sticking with an under is Tyler Hero. We're looking at his points plus his assists. We're looking at under 25 and a half of those. And that's because the Magic allow the fifth fewest points and the fifth fewest assists to shooting guards. Tyler Hero has gone under in four of his last five against the Magic. He did go over in his most recent matchup against them. Looking at his last 10, he's covered this four times, averaging 24 and a half points and assists. Um, he's hit this line at 65% on the season, so he's going over most of the time. But obviously, that line's been brought down because of the difficulty of the matchup and Jimmy Butler and Bam both playing. So, um, mostly unders you're going to find in that Magic versus Heat if you're just looking at markets. But that's because both teams are better defensive teams compared to others across the league. Let's get into the next one. We're looking at the Denver Nuggets versus the Washington Wizards. So first one we're looking at is Tyus Jones, and we're looking at an under in his points and assists of 18 and a half. That's because the Nuggets allow the six fewest points and the seventh fewest assists to point guards this year. Tyus Jones has covered this in six of his last 10, averaging 19.4 points and assists per game. He is on a back-to-back -back as well. In his head-to-head -head matchups against the Nuggets, he's hit this one out of three games. He's averaging 11 points and assists. Um, if the Nuggets absolutely suffocate these guys, I wouldn't be surprised to see him go well under. But if the Nuggets fall asleep here and they let, let the Wizards say in the game, there's a chance that this guy could go over. So it really depends on that game script and how you think that's going to play out. But the next under we're looking at is for Denny Ardbia. We're looking at his points and rebounds for under 20 and a half. And that's because the Nuggets allow the seven fewest points and the third fewest rebounds to small forwards this year. He's hit this in one of two, averaging 19.5. In his last 10, he's hit this six times, averaging 22.7 points and rebounds. Because the matchup is difficult, this line's going to be a lot lower than what he has been averaging recently, which is what we see here. But on the back-to-back, -back, can he be just as effective? I'm not too sure. The next one, Kyle Kuzma, under 27.5 points and rebounds. The Nuggets allow the six fuels points and rebounds to power forwards. If I find an opportunity to take an under on Kyle Kuzma, I probably will. Um, he went under today against the Spurs, I'll tell you that. And he did come up in our, our most recent video. Um, but will I back him today against the Nuggets? Possibly. He's hit this line in 5 of 10, which means he's gone under in 5 of 10. In his head-to-head -head matchups against the Nuggets, he finished in 26 last time. So one and a half under. On the back-to-back, -back, if the Nuggets blow them out, he's not going to get anywhere close to this. So definitely the one that I'm considering at the moment. The next one is for Nikola Jokic, and we're looking at an over in his points and rebounds prop if you're just looking at matchups, and that's because the Wizards allow the second most points and the most rebounds to centers on the season. He's hit this in four of his last 10 games, averaging 34.2 points and rebounds. In his head-to-head -head matchups against the Wizards, he's averaging 50 points and rebounds. He went for 57 and 43 in his last two matchups against them. Um, at first glance, yeah, I'd be bloody all over this one. Jokic going to fill up the stat sheet on these bastards, but look, I'll wait till I've sewed up a little bit before I place any bets. Another one is Aaron Gordon. He's got a good points and rebounds matchup as well. The Wizards allow the six, six most points and the third most rebounds to power forwards. He's hit this in one of two against the Wizards. And then over his last 10 games, he's hit this five times, averaging 21.1. Um, look, Aaron Gordon's not a key player in this one, so a lot of the time I only back him if he's the only one with a great matchup and he's got good form. Um, given that Murray probably has a good matchup, Jokic has a good matchup, Michael Porter has a good matchup, Aaron Gordon, probably someone that I'd leave aside. Talking about Michael Porter Jr. though, we're looking at his PRA in this one. And that's over 24 and a half points, rebounds and assists. And that's because the Wizards allow the most points 
the most rebounds and the second most assists to small forwards this season. Now, Michael Porter Jr. has hit this in five of his last 10, averaging 23.4 points, rebounds, and assists. His last game against the Washington Wizards, he finished with 30 points, rebounds, and assists. So given the matchup, he's great. Who's to say that he can't do it again? So strong lead for MPJ to have a big game against them. The next one is for Jamal Murray. So you notice that almost everyone in their starting lineup has a great matchup today. Uh, Jamal Murray, we're looking at his rebounds and his assists, though. It's over 11 and a half. The Wizards allow the six most rebounds and the second most assists to point guards this year. He's hit this in one of two games. Looking at his last 10, Jamal Murray's hit this in only four, averaging 11 rebounds and assists. He's perfectly capable of doing it, as you can see on this graph, with highs of 16, but he's also capable of lows of seven. But a lot of that's probably dependent on matchup. If we look to see how he's actually covering his line, his line normally sits at about 10, nine and a half and 10 and a half. So to see it up to 11 and a half, that just goes to show that the matchup is driving this line a little bit higher. Um, we'll see. It's not the strongest lean for me at the moment, but look, it's still, he's all got a great matchup and he's perfectly, perfectly capable. Let's jump into the next game. We're looking at the Indiana Pacers versus the Phoenix Suns, and that's because there's no markets for the Celtics versus Rockets at the moment. But there's a lot of markets here for the Pacers versus Suns. Let me take a breath for a second. But the first player that we're looking at here is Devin Booker. And we're looking at under seven and a half assists for Devin Booker. And that's because the Pacers allow the six least assists to point guards this year. He's only hit this line in 13 of 32 games. In his last 10, he's only hit this line in three of 10. Um, looking at head-to-head -head matchups against the Pacers. In his last one, he only finished with five assists. So season form, recent form, form against the opponent, and the matchup, they all say take the under for Devin Booker. So a very strong lean for me at the moment without having to look any further. But the next one to look at here is Bradley Beal. And we're looking at an over of 18 and a half points. Now that's because the uh, Pacers allow the most points to shooting guards this season. Bradley Beal's covered this in six of his last 10, averaging 20.5 points per game. In head-to-head -head matchups, he's had three of the paces, and he scored 23, 31, and 32 points, albeit those were all last season. Love to see it against these, this team. His recent form isn't too bad, um, and the matchup is excellent. So Bradley Beal, strong lean there on him to go over. And the next one is, we're staying on Bradley Wheel, actually, but looking at an under in his rebounds, and that's because the Pacers allow the third fewest rebounds to shooting guards. He's still hit this in two of his last three. And looking at his last 10 games, he's still hit this in five of 10. So that data is all contradicting for me, just something to avoid. The next one we're looking at is Grayson Allen, and we're looking at his points and his rebounds prop here. And that's uh, over because the Pacers allow the second most points and the third most rebounds to small forwards. Grayson Allen's only hit this in three of his last 10, averaging 18.7. In head-to-head -head matchups, he's only hit this in one of his last three, averaging 14. So he can definitely pop off at any moment, but his production is quite inconsistent because it all comes down to whether he's feeling it or not. So I don't often bet on Grayson Allen, and I don't believe this is the time for me to start. But someone I might be betting on is Kevin Durant. And we're looking at over 33 and a half points and rebounds. And that's because the Pacers allow the most points and the second most rebounds to power forwards. Now hit this, he's hit this in only three of his last 10, averaging 30.4 points and rebounds. In head-to-head -head matchups, he's covered in his last two against the Pacers. In his last three, he's averaging 40 points and rebounds against them. Now I know in his last game, Devin Booker went off for 52 points and it was a blowout. So what need was there for Kevin Durant to get involved? Um, he's really picking his time. Looking at the Pacers last game, though, Siakam did play, and they still can't defend for shit. So it doesn't matter who plays in that power forward position, they're going to leak points. So if you wanted to look at just Kevin Durant points, the line's up at 27 and a half. He's only covered that in two of his last 10, but this is the best matchup he's going to find. So wouldn't be surprised if he blows it out of the water, but also wouldn't be surprised if he continues to produce the bullshit he has been doing lately. So... Sticking with the uh, Suns, looking at Yusuf Nurkic, looking at his rebounds, um, and that's because the Pacers, we're looking at an under here, because the Pacers allow the six fewest rebounds to centers. Now, Yusuf Nurkic has been rebounding well, covering in six of his last 10. He's hit this in four straight in head-to-head -head matchups against the Pacers. He's gone into a game of six, and he's finished another game of 19. So it's a real difficult one for centers when we versus the Pacers because you're up against Miles Turner. He likes to play outside. You're not going to be in position to rebound. Um, so there's, there's that that you need to take into consideration. But he is going to have a size and physical advantage over Turner. But 
Speaking of Turner, he's actually got a difficult matchup on the boards as well. We're looking at under six and a half rebounds. The Suns allow the second fewest rebounds to centers on the season. But much like Nurkic, Miles Turner's got some very conflicting games. He's gone up. He's got 12 against the Suns. He's got five against the Suns as well. But looking at his last 10, Turner's, he's hit this six times, averaging 6.7 rebounds. He's got highs of 13, but he's also got lows of two. So those two guys, I basically wouldn't be betting for rebounds for that very reason. Their form is inconsistent. Their matchup is apparently hard, but they're up against each other. So who comes out on top? I do not know. One play that I do really like already is Pascal Siakam, and we're looking at his rebounds and his assists. So looking at an under nine and a half, and that's because the Suns allow the fourth fewest rebounds and the second fewest assists to power forwards. Pascal Siakam's only hit this in three of his last 10, averaging 8.6 rebounds and assists in his head-to-head -head matchups against the Suns. He's covered this in one of his last two. He did have 12 rebounds and assists when they match up earlier this season, but things have changed. He's in a new town, he's in a new city, new team as an Indiana Pacer. Played one game with the Pacers and he only finished with six rebounds plus assists. And I was watching that game and man, Siakam was running more than I've ever seen before. Uh, Halliburton does much of his creating, whereas in Toronto, the ball would stop a lot and it would stop often at Pascal. So Pascal's on this team to score points. He's not there to create and rebound. Um, so I do like the under here of nine and a half um, before the lines really catch up to it. So that's a strong lean for me. Uh, the next player that we're looking at here is Aaron Naismith Jr. So I don't normally bring up role players like this unless the matchup is screaming out to me. Um, and this one does scream out from a data point because the Suns allow the least points, the least rebounds, and the least assists to small forwards. So you'd be looking at under 15 and a half points, rebounds, and assists for Aaron Naismith. He's hit this in five of his last 10. He's averaging 16.9 points, rebounds, and assists. He's had two games on record against the Suns, and he's gone well under in both of them, scoring, uh, recording eight and 10 points, rebounds, and assists. So that I would need to investigate a little bit further to look at minutes, opportunities, yada, yada, yada. But at the moment, very strong lean for me to take the under on this one, given how difficult that matchup is going to be. Let's get into the next one, and it's going to be quite quick because it's the Trailblazers versus the Lakers, and there are not many markets available. There's a lot of people who are game time decisions. Um, at the moment, I can only see Anthony Davis and Anthony Simons as available, but let's talk about Anthony Simons because he's got a good matchup when it comes to his rebounds and assists. You'll be looking at over eight and a half. The Lakers are now the fifth most assists and rebounds to shooting guards. He's covered this in two of his last four, averaging 6.4. Look at his last 10 games, he's only hit this three times with 7.8 rebounds and assists as an average. Uh, personally, won't look at Anthony Simons in that particular manner, but if you just wanted to look at his points, it's inconsistent as shit. Covering four of his last 10, averaging 19.2. Against the Lakers, he's only hit that in one of four games, so... Take his under or I won't take anything for Anthony Simons. Let's have a look at Anthony Davis. On paper, he doesn't have the greatest matchup in the world, but he's hit this points line in one of five games against Portland. He's hit that points line in four of 10 games in his last 10. Looking at rebounds, he's only hit that line in three of his last 10. Against Portland, he's hit that in three straight games, averaging 13.8. Looking at his assists, he's only hit that one of five games against the Portland Trailblazers. And looking over his last 10, he has hit that in six of 10 games. So he's in great passing form at the moment, but his line has moved up to four and a half assists, which is quite high. Um, it's the highest it actually has been in quite some time. He normally sits at two and a half or three and a half. Now we see it at four and a half. Um, the lines may have caught up there. So points wise, inconsistent as hell. Rebound wise, probably could do it, but... You know, if you wanted to play it safe, 10 rebounds and three assists is probably a good bet for Anthony Davis. Add that to your picks and your parlays, baby. So that's a wrap on the preview of the games coming up tomorrow. Not as comprehensive as I would have liked. There's a lot of markets that aren't available at the moment. I am drunk as hell. We had a lot of vodka soda limes. We had quite a few beers, a lot of scotch and sodas, scotch and dry, a lot of scotch and coke. Who knows what was going on? And then I ate so much cake at the end of it. I feel like ass. So look, I've got no final bets for now, uh, but I promise you in the pinned comments, I'll put my final plays in there once I've fully recovered from the state that I'm in. Uh, but let's jump into the recap so we can talk about the day that was, shall we? Okay, so I've got bet analytics open here. Pretty entered my bets and tracked everything. 
I didn't watch much of the games today because I've been out, but my God, what a crumble. What a sh I honestly think this is the worst I've ever had, but let's talk through it. So let's talk about the Chet Holmgren ladder. We took him for two and a half, four and five. He finished on two. Apparently there was an assist that happened that's being disputed because he should have gotten three, but he was never credited for it. Either way, as it stands at the moment, it's an absolute loss. I don't know what happened, but it didn't come home. Jalen Duran, um, he was up against the Bucks, so I did watch the end of that game. I think the last, I pretty much watched the second half of that game. Um, and Jalen Duran, he just didn't see any ball, to be honest. Like normally they run something for him off the high post or he does some handoffs. He wasn't handing off shit. He was just setting screens. And if that didn't work, he went and set it off ball screen, just screen, screen, screen. Didn't get any assists or points when I was watching. So that was pretty painful. Giannis Antetokounmpo was a heartbreaking start to the day. Under 49 and a half points, rebounds and assists. He finished on 50. He got this bullshit rebound with like 10 seconds to go. Game was already lost. Uh, he missed a lot of free throws towards the end of the game to keep this bet alive, but he went off for no reason. The Bucks and the Pistons, that game shouldn't have been this close, but that hurt. Dame Lillard, we got his over 24 and a half points. He finished on 40 something, so that cash really easy. Took a value play on Dame because I was confident in him scoring 30, but for some reason, I think he's under six and a half. Well, it's not for some reason. The matchup in the last video said that he should go over his assist line. Me being an absolute fool, I saw that Dame went under his assist line in two straight games against the Pistons. And I thought if he's going to score more than 30, he'll go under his assist, line, which is stupid. He busted both of them wide open. So I didn't play that one right. So it was a good read. I had all the data. I just made the wrong decision. I'll own that. Then we had Joel Embiid over 46 and a half points and rebounds. So that was a killer because he had the greatest matchup in the world. But that game finished 97 to 89. It was rubbish. Not much was happening in it. Embiid finished with 33 points, 10 rebounds, and five assists. So he went under in all of his stat categories. And under in points, under in rebounds, under in assists. Still had a beast of a game, don't get me wrong. But uh, he didn't deliver on what I needed from him. So... Um, our value play didn't hit, our single bet didn't hit, so we got absolutely milked there. And then we had Denny Adria. I said in the last video, if this guy managed to pull down 10 rebounds, I'm going to kick myself because he's had 10 rebounds in two straight games against them. He covered his rebound line of six and a half, but he only finished on seven. So it was a big loss, but it was half a unit. We were just reaching there. And then when I got up this morning, the markets for the Cavs and the Hawks game were open. I had a look. The matchup was great. The recent form was great. Jaron Allen's feasted on these guys before, but then he didn't feast on them today. So Jared Allen, we took him for over 29 and a half points and rebounds. I think he finished on 14 and 11. So he finished on 25. The Cavs won by 20. Uh, he, he shot 75% from the field, but he only took eight shots and he only took two free throws. So not much... Energy wasted there on attack, believe it or not. The Cleveland Cavaliers, I'm just having a look now. They had seven players scoring double figures today. They beat the Hawks by 20 points and they had no one score more than 20 points. So great all-round performance. I couldn't predict that. Just absolute fuckery if you ask me. Um, so on the season, well, look, we're still looking all right, but you know, gut wrencher. We're under 10% on our ROI. 51.72 units. I'm pretty sure this is the worst I've had of the season. And I don't think my picks were too bad. Some I read wrong or put the wrong bet down, but I think the analysis was good. It gave us something to work with. But look, a difficult day nonetheless. We could easily could have gone up 10 units today, but we managed to go under. So um, we're back into it again. I put my final picks into the pinned comment. Um, I've got a few that I really like already from just what we've discussed today, but I haven't seen what the lineups look like. I haven't reassessed the schedule yet. So there's a bit more research that needs to be done, but based off what we've gone through, hopefully that's helped you out. You've got a good understanding of who's got good and bad matchups. I base that off the season. Let me know what you think about that. Do you think how a team's defense has been in the last season is more important, or do you feel the last 15 games would be more important? So Love to hear your feedback. Let me know in the comment section. Best of luck on everything you decide to choose to bet on. Do this responsibly. Follow a staking me method. So that way, when you get shit days like I just did, you've got enough bankroll to manage that. So let me know in the comment section what your thoughts are. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Up to the channel because your boy's getting busy. Coming to you live from the west side of Sydney. We've got the free picks and the juice and the daily. It's all free. You don't even have to pay me.